it's time for its episodes with quick tips you should know techniques you can implement into your workflow right here on a tale a tale oh yeah a tale of two hygienists welcome everyone into this week's tip episode i'm really excited to do this one i want to talk a little bit about having quicker appointment times and just being more efficient and I thought that, you know, the best way to do that would be using my own experiences. I know I had some experiences as a hygiene director and going into dozens and dozens of offices and seeing, you know, over well over a hundred hygienists practice. It's just, there are ways to do things and there are ways not to do things. And one of the things I like to do is just make fun of myself and just tell you all the things that I did wrong, but also I think some of the things that I did right. So that's what this tip episode's about today. One just kind of caveat to all of this. Remember, I did talk about on a different tip episode that being more efficient and being quicker is not always the best. There are definitely pros and cons to it. And you can head back over to that tip episode and listen to it. But, you know, for me personally, if I have the ability to move through an appointment quicker without cutting any crucial steps, then I absolutely want to do it. I think that everyone wants me to do it. I think the doctor wants to. I think the office wants to. I think the patient wants to. And from a personal standpoint, there's just no way that I can make up things to do, I guess, to waste time on a patient. It just doesn't, it doesn't feel right. It doesn't, I don't like it. So we're not going to do that. So I would say for a good 10 year stretch there, I was seeing patients 7am to 6pm and it was four to sometimes six days a week. I had plenty of opportunities to learn some really bad habits, but I'm grateful also because there's plenty of opportunities to work on improving and finding out the little things of changing. And so let me just run through my schedule. From the time I woke up until I get through, I think we're going through perio charting today. So we had to be there by seven. So I woke up around 545, six o'clock. I'd stumble from bed. I'd get in the shower and then put on the scrubs and barely awake. I just am grateful that we get to work basically in pajamas. So I'm already kind of happy and starting on a good note. I would grab a sugar-free energy drink from either the fridge or the store to drink on my way to the office. I'm not a big coffee guy and I never will be. So that was kind of my terrible caffeine habit. I feel like if you guys really want to talk about it, I I could talk a whole different tip episode, I think, on how to select the best energy drinks. But suffice it to say that Rockstar rules all. The end. No further questions. I'm listening to podcasts, usually on either dental, dental hygiene, or maybe some sports talk radio on the way to work. Usually about 15 to 20 minutes and I can be to the office. And that's when I'm kind of like just kind of ramping up for the day. And so then I get to the office by 645, 650. I walk through either the side door or the back door. I put my backpack down and walk into the op. And I feel like that was pretty much every single day the same. None of that probably really rotated that much. And for me, it was good because I like having a routine. And I feel like probably most of us are on a very similar type schedule where we do the same exact thing from the time that we get up until the time that we're in the office. And so next, I want to talk a little bit about my decision making and workflows I guess, I think, like I said, to the perio charting part of the patients. So I go through the office, I get to my op, I run the water until it gets hot. So I can put that in my water bottle. I lower the chair. I check the schedule to make sure I know who's coming in first. I don't, I'm not a person that does check the schedule before I go home for the day. And I actually cancel the hygienist not to do that. I think that that's probably pretty counterintuitive. I think a lot of people would tell you to do it. But for me, I just, I don't like thinking about patients for the next day or dreading what appointments I have or this or that, the other, I just almost never did. Now, what I would do though, was I would just look at bigger picture blocks of the schedule and say, okay, well, I need to move this patient here. Can they move that patient up or down or whatever to kind of fill the schedule better? But we also had really amazing people in the front. So they kind of took care of all that. I didn't really have to move too many things around very often. So after I check the schedule to see who I have, then I get the tray. Now, I should probably back up here and say that when I'm checking the schedule, it's brief. It doesn't take all that much time to do, but it's also incredibly detailed. So it's going to sound very overwhelming the first time I talk to you about this and probably for a few times as you're doing it. So what I do is I look and see what the patient is scheduled for. So then I check the notes from the last appointment. I look at the codes that were walked out to make sure I know what should be next based on what procedures were walked out and what the notes say. Obviously, if it's a profi patient or profi code, then I'm expecting it to be a profi again. But if it's an SRP appointment last time, then this should be either the perio re-eval and or a perio maintenance. I check to make sure that we have all the current radiographs. I also scan to see when the last ones were walked out because sometimes the ones that have the date on them are different than the ones that are walked out because we're just not paying attention to codes sometimes. So I just make sure that there's no discrepancies there. 
The radiographs will confirm also that the patient is in for the correct appointment. So if it's scheduled for a profi and then there's bone loss everywhere, it means that I just need to learn more about the patient and figure out what's going on. And while I'm doing that, I noted the patient's caries risk. If they are moderate or high, I can expect that this appointment will be taking some more x-rays. If they're low risk and had radiographs last year, then I quickly scan just to make sure that they're diagnostic. Because if they're not diagnostic, then we have to retake them anyway. But if they're pretty good and there's no notes from the doctor that says we need to take some more, then we're not going to be taking more pictures that day. The frequency is a pretty important thing to document. I don't think we're going to talk about notes, I think, in the next episode. But the frequency of x-rays is something that doesn't really get documented a whole lot in a lot of management softwares. So it's always a good idea to put that in the notes. And then I also checked the perio chart. I'm not going to get into a big discussion about perio chart right this minute, especially not like when and how often do you need to be doing it. I'm just a firm believer of assessing risk. So whatever that looks like for you to make sure that you are the most up to date on assessing the patient's risk and then working accordingly to make sure that you are mitigating that risk or removing the, the factors that are causing that person to be at high risk. That's kind of on you to on how often you need perio chart to achieve that end goal. But if I do have a current perio chart, then I'm good to go. I should also say that all of this double checking that I'm doing, all this confirming, it's just because I've worked so many years with multiple hygienists. I think that sometimes, I, I mean, it's always good to ch- double check yourself, but I feel like you pretty much know what you're doing and especially if there's continuity of care with you and your patients. But when you're working with multiple hygienists, I would love to say that we're perfect, but we're just not. And a lot of times, you know, we have doctors and assistants also inputting information and, you know, sometimes things get dropped or sometimes things just aren't accurate. And so it's really important just to double check. It doesn't, honestly, all of this stuff that I'm talking to you about, it really doesn't take but like a minute or two. You can scan through this really, really pretty quick. So there I am, I'm looking at the chart. I just want to make sure that I'm just not in for a surprise conversation with the patient of, Hey, you're here for a profi, but no, I'm not. I'm here for this. And oh, well, you have, you know, $400 you have to pay. Oh, I didn't know that. So I don't want to go into any of that kind of stuff. So, okay. So I reviewed the patient's chart. And at this point I have two options for me of what I can go do. So one, I can get my tray set up because I know what that patient needs, or I can look through the rest of the morning schedule and make a couple of notes as needed. So what I'm trying to do when I scan the charts is pretty much plot out the rest of my morning. I want to see which visits are going to take the most time and which ones are going to be quicker. So the healthier patients, obviously the less time. And then that information tells me if I have a little bit of a buffer time, I can spend more time maybe on a, on a more difficult patient or a more difficult case. I also look at pain points that the doctor might have and when I would, might be able to go steal the doctor and, and do an exam. I'm a huge believer in getting the doctors in as early as possible. I always make sure that the radiographs and the periods are, are at the very, very least complete. And I look at their schedule. I see what I'm stacked up against on their side to see if it's worth calling them over or not. If I know that they're in the middle of a procedure, I'll just wait maybe because you kind of hear in the the next room kind of where they're at in their procedure. So if I realize they're starting to wind down, I'll either have the assistant or I myself will just kind of put a note and just go give it to them ahead of time. So they know to come visit me next. I think the handoff or I guess it's not really a handoff, but I think the, the communication with the patient at this point is very important. So if I know that the doctor has an opening pretty early on, I usually let the patient know that, hey, we're going to be doing something just a little bit backwards today. I'm going to have the doctor do the exam first. And one of the reasons is because honestly, I'm looking at the doctor's schedule and they're slammed and I don't want you to have to wait patient. I'm talking to you. I don't want you to have to wait for the doctor later on. And I don't think that doctor wants to be rushed through this exam. I think the doctor wants to take really good care of you. So if it's okay with you, I'm going to go grab the doctor now, or at least let the doctor know that I'm ready. Now, if they can come in great, if they can't, they can't, but at least they know that we're ready for them. And, And if they need another 10 minutes, I'll keep working but then they might interrupt me in the middle of it. And that's okay with me. I'll just finish up as soon as they're done. It's a really easy conversation to have with the patient. Now, I think some of you are probably thinking at this point, well, you know, what if you find something during your hygiene procedures? Isn't it better just to wait until the doctor, like when you're completely done of all of your findings? My thought is no. And because in my opinion, if between you and the doctor, you can't evaluate the patient's radiographs and you can't evaluate and see something, you know, abnormal during your period charting or the head and neck exam, then you probably need more training yourself. And it's not to say that we don't all miss things. I've admitted that probably three or four times already in this episode that we, we definitely miss things. We totally do. But to my recollection, there's probably a handful of times, maybe that I had to have doctor come back and look at something. And of those times, when I really think about it, man, we should have caught it somewhere else. That was our bad for missing it the first time and not, you know, I don't think it was something that I uncovered that was undiscoverable any other way. 
So that is absolutely an Andrew opinion there. Maybe I also just work with some of the best doctors. I don't know. But for reals, I would say don't let the times that this doesn't work by grabbing the doctor early and, and maybe having to go get them again or you know whatever. Don't let those few times outweigh all of the thousands of times that it's going to work. Try and look at the positive side of that and think about how much less stress that your doctor is going to be if you're looking out for them to make their life easier. If you're not constantly, you know, tapping your foot outside their operatory or making them feel any sort of way. I also think that the doctors really appreciate if I can get them out for lunch a little bit earlier, if I can get them out to go home a little bit earlier, they really appreciate that kind of stuff too. All right. So a couple more parts. So for my trays, again, I'm going to try and make this as streamlined as possible, but it's going to sound really complicated. Just put it in motion a few times. You'll see that it actually does work pretty well. So you go, you grab your tray. And and the important thing is all of these things need to be in one area. You can't be running around the operatory or running around your sterilization area trying to find these things. But you grab your tray, you grab your tray liner, you grab two pieces of two by two gauze. You grab your perio or your profi cassette, depending on what procedure it is, the bib, the sterilized or disposable bib clip, your suction tip, your air water syringe, ultrasonic tip according to the procedure, ultrasonic sheath, aka SteriMate, sterilized hygiene handpiece, profi paste, profi angle. These should, again, all be in the same area. And so when I'm grabbing it, I grab them in the same order every single time so I don't forget something. You don't want to forget something and have to run all the way across the clinic and grab it again. So a couple of notes about all of this, though. One, that black candle of a Cavitron, I call it the SteriMate, it is supposed to be removed and sterilized between patients, 100%. And it just pulls off the end. You might not have ever tried that before, but I will say also be careful when you're pulling it off. Don't pull it by the cord or else you're going to break it. So hold that blue part where that adjusts that water flow and then pull directly out. Don't pull it at an angle or bend it or anything like that. The other thing, you need no more than two pieces of gauze. I see sometimes that people will put piles of bloody gauze on their tray and I'm like, you have water and suction. Please, please, please use that. One, it's much less wasteful. It also takes almost no time at all. But also, patients don't want to see that much bleeding. It is really not good for that either. The gauze, for me, it sh- should be used for oral cancer screenings and possibly wiping down the mirror. There's a debate on whether you should use that gauze to wipe your instrument to kind of clean it up a little bit. I'm thinking you probably shouldn't because it's a sharps hazard. But I'm not going to tell you one way or another. That's just not really what I'm about but just quit wasting gauze. That part bothers me. I also don't know the latest on sterilizing bib clips because I feel like it's gone back and forth multiple times. At first it was, hey, just wipe down your bib clips. Then it was like no chains. And then it was no chains and you have to sterilize it. And then it was, you have to use disposable. And then it was, you can just wipe down your regular bib clips again. And and so it's really confusing for me. And I think the information that gets handed down to me is really coming from all these companies that have a vested interest. So I'm not really sure what the right answer is for me. I'm probably still okay with just doing the sterilizing my bib clips, not the metal ones, but just the silicon ones that goes around the neck and doing that between every patient that feels the most right for me. I would say get a six pack and not of beer, but of the bib clips and you'll be fine to go through the day. I think with those ones. And the last point in this section is that when you're choosing an ultrasonic tip, you got to know what you're getting yourself into. I would be willing to wager that the green Cavitron tip, and I personally love a triple bend should be used on most of your patients. But what I was seeing going into all these offices over the past several years was that there was like one green tip and like eight blue tips, the ones for like that heavy tenacious calculus. And then they would have their units turned up almost all the way to the very, very max power. And this is just one area. I just, it it drives me so crazy. I would say do this though. Don't take my word for it. What you should do is go take a course that's provided by the manufacturer to learn how to use the right tip in what situation and with what power. And when you know this information, then I think it'll be easier to assess, okay, I have a profi patient, it's this tip. I have a perio patient, it's this tip. I have a perio patient with heavy calculus, it's this tip. There's so many things that you could do. So I have the tray set up, I know what procedure I'm doing with the patient, I have my timing with my doctor down. The only thing really left is just doing the things, doing the procedure. So a couple of tips for the procedures, and then I promise we're, we're almost done with this episode. So radiographs, here's a few little tips. So I find that salt under the tongue has worked really, really well for me for almost all but one, I think, of the gaggers in my time. It doesn't get rid of the sensation completely that the person wants to gag, but I think it does a really dang good job. And at least they can hold still because I think that it confuses the brain for a minute that they the brain thinks that there's food in there. Obviously, there's not. And the patient can tolerate a little bit more. Gagging is 100% in the patient's head. So I always preface it by saying I've had 
really good success with this one. Only one person ever in my career out of thousands has not been able to tolerate this. You can do it. Give them those positive reinforcements right at the beginning and let them know that you have a secret cure that this is going to work that no one else has ever done for them before. And that's going to help. I also find that telling the patient to bite with their teeth, but keep their lips open helps a whole lot. It helps in the areas where patients complain that it's too shallow, that it cuts them for whatever reason. I can't explain why, but also kind of way back in the posterior shots that doesn't feel like it's going all the way down their throat. Another thing that I found to be very helpful is I have the patients open up really, really big, keeping that occlusal plane parallel to the floor. After I place a sensor, I have them lean their head back on that headrest. I find that this helps them not move, first of all, but also gives them something to think about. It feels like they're a part of the team. And since that tube head doesn't care how the film is oriented, only the sensor to the tooth relationship matters. I never have a picture that is tilting or anything like that. I also think that it helps like the saliva kind of drain in the right direction. Perio charting, using tools to help perio chart, uh, like voice activated or the dental foot pedal are always helpful. I've had some amazing assistants in my time though, and nothing will take the place of an assistant. They are intuitive. They're helpful. I would say that if the assistant is new to you, however, you or you have a weird style of perio charting like I do, then you'll probably want to double check their work to make sure it's accurate. One of the things that I would do is I would look at the previous perio charts, assuming they're available, and always the x-rays. And I know kind of what I'm getting myself into. And, and so I have a shorthand code with my assistants where the 323 would kind of be an assumed number. And I would tell them what tooth I'm working on. And if all of a sudden I went from tooth number four to tooth number eight without saying anything, they knew that it was 323. But if it was 322 or 222, I would still call out those numbers. I want to be very accurate still, but that 323 pattern, we know that it, it kind of actually drove me a little crazy having to speak it all the time. And then depending on the system, I think it's more helpful to have one measurement at a time. So what I mean by that is, you know, don't go back and forth between all of your pocket depths, all of your bleeding, all of your session on tooth number two. Just do all of the pocket depths, be done with it. Do all of the bleeding, be done with it. Do all of the gingival margins, be done with it. I think that that's super, super helpful, especially if someone's helping you out. If you've ever had to assist with that, it gets really, really confusing. Um, But regardless of how you do your perio charting and what order you do it with assistant or without, it has to be recorded for each and every patient. Like that's the only thing that has to happen. There's a lot more to talk about in the next episode. I think the next one might not be quite as long as this one but I'm going to cover oral cancer assessments, scaling, breaking down and setting up your room and notes. So hopefully I'll give you some tips to make these things a little bit faster. I realize now that I'm at the end of this thing that I started speeding up my speech a lot. So feel free to go back and listen to this once again. If you need any notes or anything like that, email me, Andrew at a tale of two hygienist. Also, if you have any good tips for everyone else to increase your speed or efficiency, I would love an email again, Andrew at a tale of two hygienist. And I'll be sure to share it with the rest of the listeners. Thank you so much for listening. I hope everyone has a great weekend. Enjoy. A tale of two hygienists.